welcome to episode two of a podcast about murder. I'm your host Freya and I'm here again with Jem and we're going to discuss another case today. Uh, Just like last time, Jem doesn't know what case we're going to talk about. For this episode, I've chosen one I'd never heard of before, uh, as opposed to last time where I chose one that I did know a lot about before. Um, And I actually chose one from over in Switzerland, which for for the listeners' information is where Jem lives and is located currently. So it will be interesting to know if you've ever heard of this uh, case at all. It's not recent, um, but it is supposed to be the most famous Swiss murder case ever. And it is known as the Siwen murder case. Um, Could be Siwen, could be Suwen. Computer says Siwen. That's what my computer reads. How is it? It's spelled S-E-E-W-E-N. Yeah, I think it's C. I think that means lake. Mm. in in german well, that's interesting uh because so it is in the north which is the german a bit yeah most of it <laughs> is the german bit to okay. be honest <laughs> um okay well let's get right into it uh Seewen is a municipality in the district of Dorneck, which is in the canton of solothurn which is in northern switzerland <laughs> yeah basically very remote Mm. just over a thousand people lived in this area so yeah it's not uh it's not popping down in (laughs) Dorneck it contains protected forest and a weekend home called Waldegli um okay I hope I'm saying that right (laughs) uh which sat within an allotment garden in the forest the home belonged to the Seagrist Sorkingers that's what my computer says. <laughs> Elsa, aged 62, and her husband, Eugene. Um, I mean, it's not Eugene, it's not got the E on the end. So I guess it's Eugen, or however you would say it in German. I'm just assuming they're German. German-Swiss, not actually German. That's an important distinction to I don't make. know, like, how proud, you know, I'm assuming Swiss people don't consider themselves to be German, even if they are no. Swiss-German. They consider themselves to be Swiss, I assume. And they speak a different variety of German as well. Yes, yeah, Swiss German. Which is interesting. Eugen was 63, that's what I'm going to call him, so sorry if I'm getting that wrong. Elsa was 62. Uh, for those of the Christian religion, there is apparently a holy day, 50 days after Easter Sunday, called Pentecost, or Whitsun, or even Sunday. It's for commemorating the day the Holy Spirit uh, descended on the followers of Jesus in Jerusalem because of reasons. Uh, I don't really know anything about it other than that it's an important day to some Christian people. It was the Pentecost weekend of the year 1976 where our story takes place. Elsa and Eugen had three other members of the Seagrist family visiting them for the holiday. Anna Westhauser, yeah Westhauser, that's that one seems quite straightforward to me. Yeah. Westhauser Seagrist Uh, She was 80 years old. She was the sister of Eugen. And her two sons, Emmanuel Westhauser, 52, and Max Westhauser, 49. They had gathered, I assume, to celebrate the Holy Day of Pentecost or Whitsunday. Fun fact, as I was typing the Holy Day in my notes, I realised suddenly that the origin of the word holiday, as in vacation, is Holy Day. Oh, shit. Yeah, it's crazy. And then I googled it to confirm that I was right about that. And as I was typing it in, I was like, holiday. <laughs> and I made oh, a two plus so cool. two equals four. So there's a fun fact. The Pentecost that year was on Sunday, June 6th. A woman walking in the area caught sight of what she described as a bloody bundle on the front terrace of the house. She immediately alerted the police to her discovery, which is good form. That's- Good instinct. Yeah. The bundle seen on the front terrace turned out to be the body of Elsa Seagrass Stackinger wrapped in a carpet. The police forced entry into the home and there they discovered the four other bodies belonging to the family lying throughout the house. Okay, so this is a pretty graphic scene. Yes, all five of the Seagrists were killed with a Winchester rifle. All of the shots hit the victims, a fact which instantly gives the impression of someone with great, sh- who's a great shot, 
very quick, yeah. very precise. 13 shots were fired and 11 of those were in the head of the victims. Um, 13 shots? 13 shots, 11 in the heads of the victims, two hit chests. So basically they never missed whoever this person was. Okay, so they're insanely good. They're a great... And yeah, so great how many are... There's five or six of them? Uh, there's five people in the house and they were all killed. Uh, the killer appeared to have immediately left the scene. The police began to suspect that only Elsa and Eugen, the homeowners, were the intended targets. They said this was because Elsa and Eugen would have been the only people expected to be there at the time. If a killer approached the house and saw that there were unexpected factors, such as the car the other people arrived in, possibly seen the extra mm. people in the house through the windows, it seemed likely they would wait for a different opportunity rather than create chaos and variables that create more potential to be caught. It seemed like the killer felt forced to kill the whole family. So police theorised that Elsa and Eugen had actually been killed prior to the arrival of their guests. Um, the killer oh. had intended to dispose of the bodies but was interrupted and surprised and by the arrival of the other members of the family and needed to quickly dispatch of them. Okay, but so they were all inside. Were they in the same room? or uh, They were throughout the house, as how it's described. I'm not sure in, a, in what position well, every person yeah. was. Um, but because of, the, because of the nature of the scene, they, felt, they thought it was unlikely that um, the killer would take on five people. I mean, yeah. a lot of these people are elderly, but it seems unlikely you would create any situation where someone could call police or something have enough time so they thought it wasn't planned this way were they able to confirm later with like forensics whether Eugen and Elsa were killed substantially before the others I don't or... think they were able to confirm that but there's this uh, it's said that one victim which they don't say which one was shot four times in the head um, which is much more than the others and they didn't say who it was but I wonder if that was the head of either Eugen or Elsa and so that that would be another reason why the police would suspect that there was actual rage involved yeah, with those definitely... ones certainly overkill four shots to the head that's not Literally. necessary <laughs> so maybe that's why police suspected they were the original targets mm. the gun was not found at the crime scene the Swiss police were able to track down a witness, the last person to see any of the family members alive. This is a man known as Joseph K. Um, okay. Joseph K. told the police that he saw Anna Westhauser Segrist with her two sons out walking and that he wished them a good evening. So either he knew them or people are much friendlier in this area than my people here in London. <laughs> oh, they definitely are. If you're out walking, like, you say hello to everyone. Oh, God, off. that just makes my skin crawl. <laughs> um, actually, he probably knew them, though, because he assumed they were on their way to the Waldegli house to visit Anna's brother, which, of course, they were. So he must have at least known of them I guess... and known of, the fa known of the family. Yeah, I mean, it's a small town. You probably know everyone who lives there and notice when other people turn up. Yeah, I would think so. With, a, with about a thousand people living there, I mm. think you would know everyone. Joseph K stated that, after, that a while after this, he heard the sound of gunfire, multiple shots being fired, but he thought nothing of it because the area in and near the forest was known to be frequented by hunters. So yeah. it didn't so raise any alarm. Very the convenient. The Seagrist car, an olive green Ascona Opal, I don't know anything about cars, was missing from the house when police arrived. Eventually, the car was found in Mutens, which is about half an hour's drive north of Siwen. It appeared that the killer had fled the crime scene in the car going north, but that the vehicle had become bogged down along the forest roads and that they'd been forced to abandon it. Blankets were found under the rear wheels, showing attempts to get the car moving again. Oh, right, I suppose. Okay. Police searched the route between the house where the Seagrists were killed and the location of the stolen car, looking for the murder weapon, 
which they thought could have been discarded along the way, uh, but they didn't find it. The investigation continued with an estimated 9,000 leads followed, a dozen people taken into custody, and it's said that other unrelated crimes were actually solved <laughs> through this oh, investigation. Wow. At least something good came of this. Yeah, at least something. Leads were followed searching for the owners of Winchester rifles, ballistically similar to the murder weapon. But no clear match came to light until 20 years later. Yes. So oh. let's talk suspects and the mystery, or perhaps lack of mystery, at play here. Um, this is an unsolved case. Um, so it's that's why it's it generated Ooh. so much sort of intrigue in... In Switzerland, the public have a lot of opinions about it, apparently. Carl Dosa. Uh, again, I'm not certain that I'm... could be Dozer or something, but we're just going to go with... Let's go with Dozer, like that. Okay. Carl Dozer was a loner. He lived in Basel, a city which so happens to be located north of Siwen. So Mutens would be on the way. So it, you know, uh. that's just something where the car was abandoned. Carl Dozer was questioned during the initial investigation because he was known to be the owner of an Italian imitation Winchester rifle. Interesting. It's all adding up so far. But he told police that he had sold the gun before the crimes occurred at a flea market. It said police thought this was suspicious, but with nothing actually linking Carl to the crime, there was no way to charge him. They couldn't link him to the victims in any way. They couldn't find any motive that he might have to kill any of them. There was no evidence that they'd even met. Hmm. No witnesses could say they knew each other. Okay, so that's a that's a big point in him being innocent, I guess. Yeah, I mean, if you can't link him to them, how do you even... Anyway. Yeah. In autumn 1996, 20 years after the Seawen murders, the kitchen of an apartment which had belonged to Carl Dozer's mother was renovated. During the renovation, a bricklayer discovered a Winchester rifle hidden inside a wall. Oh, shit. Just to make himself extra suspicious, Carl had actually left Switzerland for Africa. Uh, not oh, sure where. that's quite where. a radical move. It's a radical move. Not sure where in Africa, um, but... That's the point. They didn't know where he was. He had just gone to Africa and completely disappeared on the continent. Um, and that was in 1977, just after being interrogated. <laughs> so, oh, so not suspicious at all. The rifle was, of course, taken by police and tested, and ballistic tests concluded that it was the weapon used to kill the victims. So okay. it was kind of... That, that was conclusive as far as... I'm not sure exactly what tests they did to confirm this, but that was the information that they released to the public. They said, this is, this is the gun. Huh. And yet it remains unsolved. Well, uh, we'll get to that so. in a, just a second. Carl is <laughs> said to have essentially dropped off the face of the earth, uh, and he was never tracked down in the 90s when the gun was discovered. This is partly because, amazingly... Switzerland has a statute of limitations on murder. Did you know this? Okay. I didn't know this. Which I find incredible. Just in case anyone doesn't know what that means, it means after a certain period of time, nobody can be tried for a crime. In this case, in Switzerland, you have 20 years to try someone for murder. And after that, that's, it's over. <laughs> that's not a lot of time. No, it's really not. Especially considering how many cases there are that don't get solved for 25, 30, sometimes 40 years that we're seeing yeah, I mean, in the recent Especially recent when you know, like, how technology can advance. How DNA can come along, yeah, it's, it's just madness. Many countries have time limits for different to different degrees. It's usually unnecessarily complicated. But, for example, in the UK, they only have them for things like debts, injury compensation, and libel, things like that. Whereas in the US, uh, in a lot of states, they have the option to have a statute of limitations on everything except murder. So federal law is that you can't have a statute of limitations on murder, I believe, but the rest you can, it's up to you, the state. But I'm, I'm wondering what the advantage is. Honestly, I've thought about this so much. I've thought, what is the benefit unless you are 
a criminal and you're in yeah, government like... and you're thinking, well, I'd love to get away with that. Yeah, were these laws made by murderers? You would think. Or, like, there's a lot of talk about there being statute limitations on rape in some places in America. And it's like, who would agree to that unless you're a rapist? You know what I mean? Mm. <laughs> it's crazy. Um... Anyway, uh, it's said that a majority of the Swiss population believe Carl Dozel was the killer, but no motive could ever be established. And I don't really blame them for believing he did it because of the big fat gun consistent with the murder weapon mm. hidden in the wall and lied about. <laughs> and fleeing to Africa. Fleeing to Africa definitely helped him look super suspicious. <laughs> but nobody knows what happened to him anyway. He's gone, so it's finished. He could be dead now. I mean... Africa's a big continent. It's a massive place. Where'd you even start looking for someone in Africa? But uh, let's move on to another suspect. This was a relative of the couple, Elsa and Eugene. His name was Adolf Segrist, but he was nicknamed Johnny. Wonder why he would want to be nicknamed mm. Johnny. <laughs> Don't blame him. I would probably go ahead and change that name as soon as I realised it was my name. <laughs> <laughs> Not as trendy as it once was, strangely no, I, enough. It's bizarre, though, because you just... It used to be a common name, I think. I think it still is, actually, but it's just funny because, you you know, you'd think everyone would be like, let's just quit it. I think I think what is cool about it is that it means wolf or something like that, and that's cool. Oh, that is pretty cool. Maybe in German or Swiss German it sounds nice. Anyway, that's enough of that. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny was a cousin of Elsa and Eugene's son, Robert. So potentially the couple's nephew, but there are further afield ways to be someone's cousin. So I'm not certain yeah, exactly I guess you could how be they a were related. Cousin. Johnny was described as being 4.9 feet tall or 1.5 metres, which is not to offend anyone, but it's very small. <laughs> Little Johnny. For a grown man. Um... He was also said to have the voice of a woman. And both Ooh. of these things gave him an inferiority complex. So I can't imagine why <laughs> in the 70s. He is said to have detested the way that Elsa and Eugene nicknamed him Globby, Globby, which is the name of a goofy little parrot character from Swiss children's books. Maybe only okay. back then. Don't know if you've ever heard of that, but... Not familiar. <laughs> maybe just from the 70s. Maybe they don't really get him out much anymore, but... <laughs> I'm going to Google him. I don't know that I would murder my family over a nickname, <laughs> but it said that Johnny was short-tempered, irrational, and that he shot at styrofoam heads in his flat. Hmm. Yeah. So he... Doesn't sound great. Was practising, you know, shooting... At the head. Yeah, he's got he's got experience. It's not great. It's circumstantial, but it's not. It doesn't look great. Have you managed to have a look at Globby yet? He's Switzerland's Mickey Mouse. That's what I read as well. I read that that's how famous this character is. He looks pretty cute. Yeah, but you know, if you were a grown man and you were that's already four point nine feet tall and you were supposedly having the voice of a woman, you might have some reservations about being called that. Also, I've just read that in some issues of the um, comics, he was accused of being sexist, racist, and promoting violence. So maybe not someone you'd want to be associated with. Maybe they nicknamed him that because, not just because they were trying to infantilize him, but because he was, like, quick to violence and <laughs> irrational and just, you know, a bit of a nutter. So... Mm. A business associate of Johnny's named Hans Blazer came forward to say that he believed Johnny was the killer and that Carl Dozer had assisted him in the crime by providing the weapon and ammo. Hmm. So that ties in quite neatly with the fact that the gun's in Carl Dozer's flat, but he doesn't have a motive, but maybe Johnny does. Uh, okay. Um, so it's a bit of like, what's that book called? Is it Strangers on a Train? There's a book where... Is that, I'm sure you read it once. I don't know. Where these two people meet on a train and they both want to murder someone. So they decide to murder oh. each other's victims to... Yeah, yeah I've you heard know, of it. You know, confuse the whole thing. 
So it could have been a situation like that. You know, maybe they only knew each other vaguely, but Johnny thought that using Carl would confuse the... But so this is also 20 years later that this Mm -hmm. is all coming to light. Okay. Hans said that shortly before the murders, Johnny had asked him if he could borrow a gun. So that's that. But then it's funny to me that he would have never come forward with this information before now. Or maybe he just didn't put two and two together, I guess. Well, we'll come back to that. Uh, Additionally, three weeks before the crime, Johnny was said to have purchased ammunition. And according to the clerk who claimed to have served him, he asked if the rounds that he had purchased would fit into Italian Winchester rifles specifically. Hmm. If there is a link between Carl Dozer, who appeared to have owned and concealed the murder weapon, and Johnny Segrist, who possibly had motive to kill the Segrists, it was never discussed publicly by police. However, in 2018, a witness came forward to the press to say that he knew a mechanic called Peter N., who met regularly with Carl Dozer and that the two of them associated with Johnny Segrist. So this Mm. witness believes all three were involved in the murders and claims to have seen them in possession of a Winchester rifle. God, it's mad that, like, just last year, Mm. people are still still coming forward with information. Yeah, the police claim to still receive leads and calls about this case all the time. And they (laughs) they claim to follow them all up, but never get... Despite the statute of limitations. Right, I'm just... I'm a little bit confused because I think they can still close the case and maybe maybe there's something they would still do just have it on their books i don't know if anything would make a case for changing the law it would be something like this yeah johnny segrist was arrested back during the original investigation but he was later released and he died in the 1980s from kidney disease so if he knew anything or if he was the killer he took that with him Mm. now like uh you were saying about why would Hans say all this stuff later? Well, Hans, who came forward to accuse Johnny of the crimes, obviously pulled himself into the frame by doing so. So some believe he was the shooter. Hans was known to be a crack shot. Hmm. It's thought that maybe it was actually Hans who was the accomplice, and that a disagreement between Johnny and Hans would have led to Hans implicating Johnny. Okay. So, like, maybe they they did the murders, getting away with it for a long time, but Johnny somehow pissing him off. I find that <laughs> so... so funny to imagine that after 20... Like, they've been in this together for 20 years, you know. Probably mm. brings you closer to a person, and suddenly one day Johnny just does something, and Hans is like, no, you know what? Fuck you, Johnny. You're going down <laughs> yeah. for this murder. <laughs> Um, but the police appear to never have considered Hans as a suspect, and personally, I think this is a is more um, out there. I don't think this is as likely as Carl and Johnny, uh, just because of the gun. You can't get over. Yeah, that's the gun like quite being a, in Carl's house. That's a pretty big <laughs> issue. It's probably the ma- most biggest piece of evidence in yeah. the case, and it's in Carl's house or Carl's mother's house. It just seems like you can't remove him from the equation. He's got to be in there somehow. Was there anything about the car at any point? Um, I don't think they found any evidence of a person in the car, just that it had... They didn't know who drove it, but it must have been the killer, but they couldn't link it to anyone, I don't think. If it's true that, that he was going north, I'm just assuming it's a he that he was going north and couldn't, and then got bogged down and couldn't move the car. Does that mean he was intending to drive the victim's car all the way to his house? And then what? I don't know. Like, what's his plan at this point? (laughs) Move to Africa. (laughs) Yeah, well, there you go. So, but then you would have, it would have been an instant slam dunk. You would have been like, oh, well, here's the car going straight to Carl's house and he's gone to Africa, so it's him. (laughs) Yeah. Unless he's planning on getting to, like, a bigger town and sort of leaving it mm. there. Maybe he was just driving through, thinking, I'll pick up stuff from my house, then I'll drive the car even further, and I'll dump it, you know, in... Maybe he was going to drive out, straight out of Switzerland. That's true, if they're not far from the border. 
Yes. I don't know how that but plays. But it's really close. Um, I'll put a map on the YouTube version of the of this episode. It's it's Germany that's on top of them, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> don't want to sound like an idiot. <laughs> Robert Segrist, the son of the victims, Elsa and Eugen, was a suspect at the beginning of the investigation, and he has said that he was interrogated aggressively and that police repeatedly accused him of the murders, which he obviously denies. He implies that the police used him as a scapegoat to deflect from their inability to catch the real killer. I guess in a lot of these cases you assume that someone close to them is the murderer. So it seems logical that you would think that the son was involved Yeah, somehow. I mean, it's, all, it's pretty much always a family member. It's very unlikely to have, or, you know, someone known to the victim. It's very unlikely that a stranger comes into your house and kills you. That's it's extremely unlikely. Well, especially with a crime of passion, as you said, where someone was shot in the head yes, four and times. With the overkill, yeah, definitely this... I, I think it's it's not even a question that, you know, it was intentional, at mm. least on the couple, that there was some personal rage. He is quoted, Robert is quoted in Blick, a Swiss news outlet, question mark? Blick. Blick. I don't know. I feel like a lot of these things are specific to the Swiss-German region. Yeah, you live in the French part. So he was quoted in Blick <laughs> as saying, There was never any evidence against me. Nevertheless, the work of the officials focused on me. Many mistakes were made in the investigation. I suspect the Solothurn authorities were overwhelmed. Yeah, I can imagine. It's a small town. Probably haven't had a murder of this calibre. They've almost definitely never dealt with something like this yeah so he's implying they didn't have the resources for a crime mm. of this magnitude maybe the police are scared adding pressure they needed a guy yeah some people still think robert is the killer i mean if he isn't though th like it's been years <laughs> yeah what a life <laughs> and no one has solved his parents murder well this is his frustration he's said many times that you know, that in their focus on him, they could have focused on some some of the evidence that maybe isn't mm. doesn't exist anymore. You know, collecting more witness story. You know, people forget over time stuff they've seen, things like that. And if you're not out there on the street doing the work, you're interrogating their son, then you're not going to get mm. that evidence. On the flip side of that, though... No one would think it would be suspicious for him to be visiting his parents' house and probably wouldn't make note yeah, of that. that's true. Um, yeah, and people are not certain what the motive would be. So I don't know if there was a life insurance policy on his parents or something like that, but that never came out if that was a thing. And he was never charged. No, but also it's got to be more than just life insurance at this point. Well, people have killed, people have killed their family. I mean, obviously you have to have something wrong with you to do that, but people have killed for much less than That's you true. would think. Just depends what kind of person they are. Robert Segrist published a book in 2001 about this case named Der Mordful Seewin, or The hmm. Seewin Murder Case. Another book came out last year, 2018, called Hope for Enlightenment by a journalist named Walter Hauser. Since these books aren't published in English and I haven't read them, I can't put them up for recommended reading in the same way as I did last week with Killing for Company. But if you do happen to read German, or Swiss German, it may be worth checking those books out if you're interested in finding more details about this case, which I think is pretty intriguing. There's probably more out there on this, but it was difficult to research because most of the stuff I was finding was obviously mm. in Swiss German. And uh, Google Translate only goes so far. <laughs> yeah. The amazing thing is that um, I have confirmed that no one can ever be tried, even if new information that did come out. That is just amazing yeah. in the worst possible way. <laughs> it, it is but, amazing. Um, I mean, like, I feel like we're going, you know, going on about it being amazing, but it is just, I, I honestly just can't think of any reason why that would be okay. <laughs> And, yeah, even after this case, I mean, I guess they haven't found anyone to charge with the crime, but still, n at no point in time has someone been like, you know what, maybe, maybe we should just change that whole law. 
besides that, Carl Dozer is untraceable, Johnny Segrist is dead, um, you know, it's probably never going to be solved, not to be negative, but it's probably a mystery forever. Yeah. It's um, been a while. Hmm. Despite this, the police claim the case is still ongoing, like I said earlier, which, again, so I'm still super confused why they would continue to investigate if they can't charge anyone with it. And they've also said they currently have no leads, <laughs> even though they get calls all the time. And due to the statute of limitations, their powers to investigate are diminished as well. So they can't use the full force of right, you know so whatever they powers have, they can have normally like i guess their resources are limited because technically there's no reason yeah so i wonder why you would even assign any officers to this to be honest and I'm, I'm not saying that in a way where like obviously for robert who's still alive it's it's a tragedy if they stop right yeah he obviously wants justice so he would probably want them to continue but it's a small town and it must have really like the whole community was affected by this. Yeah, I think they I think they definitely were. Um, it's got to be, with a thousand people, it's got to be one of those places where, you know, you leave your door unlocked and you know everyone and you let your kids yeah. go out and ride their bikes in the middle of the forest and you don't even think about it because mm. that's just what kind of place it is. What do you think happened uh, going over those suspects? I personally would completely discount Hans. I think that he actually might, I mean, be I don't think help. the evidence is strong enough. No, but, you know, he could have been... He could have known about it and then just trying to save his own ass by coming forward and... Yeah, but again, it makes no sense to me for him to do that so long afterwards. Unless he knew about the Statue of Limitations. That's the other thing that's really interesting about this is that people have said it's surprising that no one will come forward because the killer can get away with it so you'd think they would write a book or you know because you can yeah, you can there's nothing point. stopping them from doing this there's nothing stopping them from coming forward uh, deathbed confession as well yeah which makes you think that it was johnny and carl and they're both gone now so because you know they would have said yeah. it right there's no reason not to I, I mean the whole the gun really for me there's no moving past that. No, the gun's the full stop placing Carl as being involved. For a, yeah, for he's sure. He's definitely involved, but it's the lack of motive that means that someone else has to be yeah. there. I'm going to go ahead and... Sorry, Robert, but I'm going to go ahead and be like, did they ever look into Robert knowing Carl? Yeah, that's a good point. I don't want to throw Robert under the bus um, if he is innocent, because he's obviously already been aggressively pursued for this. But, you know, did they ever look into that? Because it is usually a family issue. Yeah. But, you know, Johnny being the sort of hothead, it makes sense. Being so tiny. Again, no offence to anyone who is that small and is a man, but... <laughs> so so small, yet so full of rage. Yes, but that's a, like, it's almost a classic trope. Like, the angry, small man who, you know, That's is true. feeling so put down his whole life. And so one day he just thinks, I'll kill them. With regards to him, that there being no trace of him knowing um, Carl. Again, this is the 70s. It's not like they're friends on Facebook. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like how there's... do you find out that someone knows someone? Because you really have to take their word for it in the 70s. I, I didn't even really think of that. Um, you have to have a witness placing them together, like, at the pub or something like that. And if you never find yeah. that person, if they never hung out in a public place, then how do you ever know? But uh, it's an interesting one. Probably won't be solved, but... Um... I mean, in a way, the unsolved ones are always a bit more intriguing because mm. you can just theorise. Hmm. So that's it for the case of the Seawind murders. Remember, we are on social media, at About Murder on Twitter, facebook.com slash a podcast about murder with no E, and Instagram at a podcast about murder with an E. The links are in the description box. We, hopefully, by the time this episode comes out, will be on everywhere you listen to podcasts. So please do subscribe so you don't miss another episode. 
connect with us if you'd like to send us an email a podcast about murder at outlook.com thank you for listening i hope you'll join us again next friday where we will do it all over again with another case thanks for allowing us to grace your ears yep for sure and have a great weekend see you next time